Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Let's start with our blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Vinna Atan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai No Tain Hatoram. Welcome, everybody. Hope you have had a good week and um, an early good Shabbos to you. We are launching now into the second book of the Torah, which is called Shemot, which means names, or in English, it is Exodus. But it was really names, and it's because it opens up with a list of the names of the Jewish people going down into Egypt. It's a little uh, mysterious, however, because we already know who went down to Egypt, because that already happened a couple parshas ago at the end of Bereshit. So there was really no reason to articulate this again. I want to just point out one thing because we're going to be talking, <coughs> excuse me. We're going to be talking about struggles in this world. And I'm sorry, let me just get a drink. <coughs> <clears throat> the way the Torah opens up in this Parsha and in this book of Shemot on page 293, in the Hebrew 292, it says, Ve'ela Shemot B'nai Yisrael Haba'im Mitzrayma. These are the names of B'nai Yisrael who are coming to Mitzrayim to Egypt. Now we talked a little bit about this on our Tuesday class. So if you heard a little bit of this before, it's just an introduction to take us into our topic. But that word Habaim, which is the present tense, they are coming into Egypt, makes no sense because they already came into Egypt. This is, they have been there for many years. Jacob lived there for 17 years. We know Joseph already died. He died at 110. Um, it was, you know, there was uh, a lot of history already happening. So why does it open up with Exodus saying that these are the names of the Jewish people coming into Egypt when they had already come a long time ago? So there are a number of different opinions about this. One is, is that the Egyptians had completely forgotten, and I say that with air quotes because they chose to forget the greatness of Joseph and of the Jewish people and how blessed they had been by Joseph and by the Jewish people and how much they had benefited from them. And they chose to forget that. And um, as has happened throughout Jewish history, when people, nations forget about what the Jewish people's contribution has been to the success, economic, social, cultural, and every other way to their nation. So it says that they're coming to Egypt as if they were just coming, which means I kind of forgot you were already here. And no matter how long you're here, I will always think of you as a newcomer, which was like the Jews of Poland who had been in Poland for over a thousand years. And yet they were deemed to be not really Polish and not really Germans and not really Spaniards, et cetera. So that's one understanding. The other is, is that our experience in Egypt is going to be a pattern for future exiles and redemptions, and that the word Haba'im is an acronym for each of the exiles that we will experience in the future. And the He, which just means Ha, the, is not counted in there, but the spelling of Ba'im, which is Bet, Aleph, Yud, and Mem, is a reference to each of what are called the four exiles. The Bet refers to Bavel or Babylonia, the Aleph refers to Edom, which is uh, Rome, which is the one that we are in now. The Yud is Yavan, which is Greek. And the Mem is Madai, which is Persia. So these are each of the called the, each of the four exiles. And they're referenced here to say, this is Egypt that's happening here, but there are going to be, a, there are going to be future exiles and redemptions. So I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty challenging to hear that, that um, before we're even getting started in the book of Shemot, we're already being told about the future challenges that we are going to have. So what we're going to talk about today is about our challenge in life for facing challenges and our expectations about things going well. 
And how do we deal with frustration? How do we deal with setbacks? How do we deal with things not going the way we planned? How do we deal with our own shortcomings, our own failures? We try and try and try at something and we don't really succeed. What do we do with that? So this Parsha is just a great um, lesson in that because Moshe is going to have to deal with incredible frustration. So when he meets God at the burning bush, which is already going later into the later into the Parsha, he is he, he's not really so interested in being the person who is going to lead the Jewish people. Uh, he says he has a heaviness of tongue. He has some sort of a speech impediment. Maybe God should send Aaron. Maybe, you know, somebody else, anybody but him. So he's really demurring a lot to the point that God gets frustrated with him and gets angry. So it's like, it's going to be you. I'm sending you. Now, that being said, with that level of frustration, then what also happens is that God tells Moshe that basically his efforts are going to be unsuccessful initially, and it's going to go through a long process. So he says to Moshe, hold on one second here. Um, he tells him, um, I'm sorry. marked it and then I lost it. I apologize. Let me just get this. I he's going. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um sorry I had my string in there instead of a little tab. I was looking for the wrong thing. So this is on page 311 in the Hertz, in the Stone Chumash, and it is chapter 4, verse 21. Hashem said to Moshe, when you go to return to Egypt, see all the wonders that I have put in your hand and perform them before Pharaoh, but I shall strengthen his heart and he will not send out the people. You shall say to Pharaoh, so said Hashem, my firstborn son is Israel. So I say to you, Pharaoh, send out my son, meaning the Jewish people, that he may serve me, meaning God, but you have refused to send him out. Behold, I shall kill your firstborn son. Somehow I always, I missed this sentence in all these years of reading the Torah. It's like, wow, Moshe knew from the beginning that this was going to end with the killing of the firstborn. He certainly doesn't tell Pharaoh that from the get-go, because we, we know that. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, let us go to, we're going out to serve God. We need three days. Let us go. And Pharaoh says, no. There's no mention of killing the firstborn until we get to the 10th plague. I think we all know that from dipping our finger in the wine at our seders, right? We do Adam, Sardea, um, blood, et cetera. We do all that. And then the last thing is Makot Bechorot, of the killing of the firstborn. So what was this? So this was God's attempt to give Moshe uh, strength to deal with all the frustration that's going to unfold so that he would know what the end game was. The end is going to be, you're going out and I'm going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn. That's going to be the end. You're not going to say that at the beginning. He's not going to know that at the beginning. And there's going to be a whole process that unfolds. And it's going to be a back and forth. Pharaoh says, no, then you say, I'm going to give this plague. And it's going to go through a whole 10 step process. And it's only going to end when it ends. But I'm telling you up front that Pharaoh is going to give you a hard time. Like, so how does this impact Moshe? If you know up front how something is going to end and then you're being told like, don't worry, this is going to be really, really frustrating. You're going to go through this whole process and you're going to be stopped along the way. Your plans are not going to work out. What you say is going to be thrown in your face. It's going to be a big, big challenge. You're like, on one hand, it's like, oh, I don't know why, you know, in Hebrew, they say, I don't really have the energy for this process. On the other hand, there is something reassuring to know that in the end, it's going to work out. And it gives him, him the patience. Yes, Renee. So I was just kind of reading around it. 
and this is really fascinating to me. I feel like it's supporting what you're saying. So um, pay, also page 11, uh, verse, verse 18, and, and Yitro said to, Moses, to Moshe, go to peace. So he says, go to peace right before, you know, Hashem is warning Moshe about what's going to happen. That's true. So this is the, I mean, it's just interesting that Moshe is, has good, um, what's called Derek Eretz. He's like, has very, he's very polite. And he goes to get his father-in-law's permission to leave because he was shepherding his flocks. And so when, that's what you say, Lech Shalom, go to peace. Um, go, that means go on your way and you should go. Um, but that's a nice way of understanding it too, of like, oh. go in peace, like don't be. So mostly that's coming from Nitro saying, you have my permission to go. Which, you know, if the creator of the universe is commanding you to do something, it's not really, would really be his father-in-law's place to say, well, let's see, I don't think you should go. I'm not letting you. So, no, well, I'm sorry, but I mean, Yitro is a really, um, you know, sadist, right? Yes. So you don't think, I mean, maybe I'm off on the deep end, but you don't think that it's also him having some kind of definition of that he's also supporting him in a spiritual way, you're going, I mean, it's the English that I'm reading. So, and you know, and he's saying go to peace, that makes me think that he also knows that he might be addressing something and that you throws there to say, hey, don't worry. I, am I reaching for it? And maybe a little, but I still like it. You know, I still like it. So <laughs> it, it's certainly true that Yitro supported him in what he was doing. And, um, but he, but, Moshe wasn't looking for the support. He was looking for permission out of politeness, um, just out of because it's his father-in-law and he's been living with him and Yitro took him in when he fled from Egypt. So he's being polite um, and he's giving us a lesson. I mean, he could just come in and say, hey, Yitro, God just commanded me to go to Egypt. So I'll be leaving now, bye. So he could have done that, but he doesn't do that. He's, he goes and he says, let me now go back to my brethren who are in Egypt to see if they are still alive. So that's, that's what he's saying. And then Yitro says, Lech shalom, um, go, um, go to peace. So, but I like what you're saying too, is that he also gives him support, um, though he doesn't really have a sense of what the whole story is going to be about. I don't know how much Moshe revealed to him, but he just said, I'm going to go back to my people. And he takes um, Zipporah with him. So this is Moshe is being, is being primed for dealing with struggle. So the question is, does struggle and disappointment and things going badly, is this like a mistake in the creation process? Is this a mistake in our lives? We act like it is. When things don't go the way we've planned, or when I am not successful in doing what I want to do, maybe because of other people, other circumstances, or just my own shortcomings. I worked on something and it didn't work out. I put in my effort and it went, you know, it went down the, down the tubes. You know, it, it didn't happen. So what is this? Is this a mistake in creation? So we, for that, we actually have to go back to the very, very beginning of creation. So if you want to turn back to Genesis, literally on the first page, which is page three of the, of the Chumash, when it describes the very beginning of creation, when it says in verse two, the Haaretz Haita Tohu Vavohu Vahoshech Alpnei Tahom. Those descriptions there, that the earth was empty and darkness and void, and there was uh, on, the, um, on the surface of the deep. It says those descriptions are actually described as indications set into the very fabric of creation, those are also considered a reference to the four exiles. Each of those is considered one of the exiles. Like, are you telling me from the very beginning of creation, we already know that there's going to be a whole pattern of exile, which basically means a pattern of failure and going falling down and getting up on a personal as well as a national level? And the answer is yes. So if we know that that's the process, then we are less alarmed by it and we have more perseverance and ability to not fall into a place of despair and to never give up. So it's not that we never give up because you should be strong and never give up. We never give up because that's part of the plan, part of the plan. I know people have heard this about 
uh, who was it who discovered it? electricity? Now I'm blanking out on his name. Um, you mean Edison? Edison? Thomas Edison, yes. He had, I think, 2,000 experiments, what we would call failed efforts, to create electricity. I shouldn't say create it, to figure out electricity. And when he was asked, how does it feel to have failed 2,000 times? He said, I never failed ever. He said, each thing, each, each piece got me closer and closer and closer to finding the answer. He didn't see it as like, you know, why am I even doing what I'm doing? It's complete failure. That the microscopic increment in how he was progressing, he didn't see as failure. He saw that as part of the process. When we can see that instead of judging it and saying like, I can't believe I'm such a loser. I can't believe like, you know, I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I don't have it. It's like, okay, so doesn't matter. Just start over, just start over. So Moshe is being primed for this because the worst thing it says is for a person to come into a place of what's called yeush. Yeush means despair. Oh, it's called giving up, throwing in the towel, it's over. It says that's not, an, that's not an option because Moshe is going to be a person who is going to face that and be a likely person to say, you know, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And not only doesn't it work, when he sets out on his mission, things get worse for the Jewish people rather than incrementally better. It's not even incrementally better. It gets worse, which we see at the end of this week's Parsha, at the end of the Sefer, I'm sorry, at the end of the Parsha of Shemot. So if you go to the end of the Parsha, it says, um, well, let's actually go back a little bit um, to page 315. This was after Moshe had asked for the Jewish people to, to go. I should go back to 313. Verse one of chapter five. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh. So said Hashem, the God of Israel, send out my people that they may celebrate for me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh's response is, who is Hashem that I should heed his voice to send out Israel? I do not know Hashem, nor will I send out Israel. So they said, the God of the Hebrews happened upon us. We're going out, et cetera, et cetera. And what is Pharaoh's response? It's not even just no. Go to verse four. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you disturb the people from its work? Go to your own burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now numerous and you would have them cease from them burdens. And that, that day he says to the taskmasters, we're not even giving them any straw. They're gonna have to go out and gather their own straw. So what happened, this was like Moses' first foray into now we're gonna let the people go. Not only are you not going, I'm gonna make it worse for you. And the, said, if you go down to the um, verse 13, the taskmasters pressed saying, complete your work. The daily matter each day is when there was straw. The foremen of the children of Israel whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had appointed over them were beaten saying, why did you not complete your requirement to make bricks as yesterday and before yesterday? even yesterday and even today. The foreman of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh saying, why do you do this to your servants? Straw is not given to your servants, yet they tell us make bricks. Behold, your servants are being beaten and it's a sin for your people. The taskmasters go to Pharaoh like, what are you doing? If you want something done, you're withholding the, you're withholding the materials for making these bricks. And what's the response of Pharaoh? You're lazy. You are lazy, lazy. Therefore you say, let us go and bring offerings to Hashem. Now go to work. Straw will not be given to you, but you must provide the quota of bricks. The foreman of the children of Israel saw them in distress when they said, do not reduce your bricks, the daily matter each day. And now they go to Moses and Aaron, like thanks a lot for all your help. Standing opposite them as they left Pharaoh, they said to them, may Hashem look upon you and judge for you have made our very scent abhorrent in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants to place a sword in their hands to murder us. So the people are complaining now. So how are things going on this round? Moshe, go and you're going to free the Jewish people. It's like now the Jewish people are upset with them because now things have gotten worse. And now Moshe goes to God. It's like, what are you doing? Moshe returns to Hashem and said, my Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why have you sent me? From the time I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he did 
faithful to this people, but you did not rescue your people. Seems that Moshe forgot everything that God had told him at the burning bush, which is, this is going to be a process. I'm going to, Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened and he's not going to let them go. It's not going to let him go until we get to killing his firstborn. But then Hashem says to Moshe, now you'll see what I shall do to Pharaoh. For through a strong hand will he send them out, and with a strong hand will he drive them from his land. So this is God reminding Moshe, like, I'm not doing evil. That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. That's what it sounds like. But this is all part of the process. So how often do we attempt to do something? And not only doesn't it work out, it's worse than it was before. It's like, how did that happen? It just went from bad to worse. Does that mean I should give up now? And the answer is no, to never, ever give up. So Moshe is going to go through a process himself of gaining his own trust and faith in God and his trust and faith in the process. And the Jewish people are going to have to weather this. And this has been set into motion in the very fabric of creation at the global level, at the communal level, at the individual level. It was then, it was in the past, it's today on December 23rd. 2021. My plans, I had such great plans. They didn't work out. Do I give up? The answer is no. It's like, okay, so I'll do it differently. I'll do something else. I'll keep on going. I'll keep on trying. Talk about that in terms of also of learning. It says, you know, learning Torah doesn't come easily to everybody. For so many people, it's very challenging or they learn something and they forget. And so if you're like one of those people, like, should you then give up? Like, well, you know, I'm just not cut out for this. And the answer is no. This is because especially when it comes to Torah, there is a mitzvah to learn Torah, to put in the effort to learn Torah. There is no mitzvah to remember it. I mean, that's nice if you do, and obviously you wouldn't want to, but it's like, does it not count if I learned it, but then forgot it? It's like, no. So it's like, it's okay. Now, obviously everybody should make an effort to put in their best effort and do the best they can to hang on to it. But just because somebody forgets, it's like, okay, don't give up, go back to it again tomorrow. So there was a beautiful story about a, um, a yeshiva um, and there was a wonderful rabbi, now I forget who, which rabbi it was, one of the great, great rabbis. And he had told his class, you know, we're gonna learn this Masechet of Talmud. Uh, Masechet is like, um, I'm going to hold this up. This is like a Masechet of Talmud. We're going to learn this and we're going to, this is like our, our thing for the next few months. We're going to be learning this and all the, and we're going to ha have a big celebration and we're going to have a big seum, a party, and it's going to be amazing. And uh, the boys were real excited. And then there was one boy who was looking very, very despondent and downcast. And he asked to see the rabbi in his office afterwards. And he said, you know, everything you said just made me feel miserable. I'm dyslexic and there's no way I can finish this whole Masechet. I won't be able to participate with you. And instead of even saying, the rabbi saying, you know what, just do your best, whatever you can do. He said, come see me tomorrow. So the boy's okay. So he goes back tomorrow, the next day, the rabbi had taken out one page of the Talmud. He'd like cut it out had taken it to a binder with a cover to put a cover on this one page and said, this is your Masechet. You finish this and you will make a seum with all of us. That's your Masechet because that's what he could do. And you put in your, you put in your best effort and that counts. And that's all we are supposed to do. So we put in our best effort we keep putting in our effort. We don't get blown away. We don't get despondent. We don't despair. And we hang in there. And Moshe, God is telling Moshe, I am, this is how the world works. From the beginning of creation, this is how it works. I'm a perfectionist kind of a person, and I'm very impatient. And I want things to work out the way I want. And I, sometimes it's the small things that are harder for me than the big things. We, so this is so small, but I was so frustrated. I am so frustrated. You know, we're building an apartment in Israel. And so we're having all these cabinets. And so we thought, okay, you know what? The handles are much less expensive here in the States than in Israel, we'll get them here. 
So went on to went to Lowe's, picked out three different handles, wanted to see what they looked like, put in an order. Just got a message from Lowe's. We've canceled your order. None of these are available and they will not be available anytime soon. I'm like, so my husband said, so, so we'll check out um, Home Depot. I'm like, they all come from the same place. This was from the vendor. The vendor, the people is like, they're not going to be here anytime soon. I'm like, that's so frustrating. Now what am I supposed to do? So, because I want the handles that I wanted. So now this kind of derails me more off, honestly, can derail me more than something big because it's like the little things for sure we expect to go our way. It's like, what's the problem? So yes, I know there's supply chain things, but it shouldn't be affecting me and my life. It's, you know, if it affects other people, that's okay, I'm sorry for them, but you know, it shouldn't affect me. And what about my handles? So this has been like a source of aggravation. So PS, I haven't found any handles yet. Um, I don't know where they're coming from whatever i'm like great we have all these cabinets we can't open them because there's no handles so it'll all work out i'm sure in the end run i have no idea when i don't know what but all these things so whether it is a little aggravation but you think about what gets us flustered during the day it is all these things this person didn't do what i was expecting this plan didn't work out my washing machine broke, you know, my washing machine is acting up. I have to lean on it like a, you know, whatever to make it go through all its cycles. That's me. I have to, um, it's so annoying. So like all of these things are our frustration. Even when we talk about somebody going postal or road rage, where is that coming from? It's coming from frustration and the desire to be in control. If we realized how much we were impacted by this, uh, yeah, so thank you. I don't need to, I, I, yes, I do know how to make temporary tape handles. It's just, I want things to be perfect, but thank you. Uh, yeah, I want them to be my perfect handles that are my oil bronze, whatever. Okay, uh, yes. So all of these things, when you think about people, that their life, their frustrations with themselves um, in academics, in their work, with their families, with other people, with organizations, with shuls, with this, with that. If you think about, and we had to do a calculation of how much of our time is devote, is ends up being, I will say stolen or downgraded by low level or high level frustration, it's a lot. But if we have the thing, it's like, you know, my friends, people, God telling you, this is how it goes. And they're like, well, that's life. It's like, no, this is life. And is how we navigate all of this. That's where, that's the only thing we're responsible for. We're actually not responsible for whether the things turn out. We think we are. We want to control it, but we're not responsible. So Moshe has told this, and it takes him a while to catch on. Um, and he clearly doesn't do it the first time. He just had this conversation with God, and he's already upset. And I think it's because not only didn't the Pharaoh let the people go but that he made it worse. So on the other hand, it's, it's, um, it's, some, it's a compliment to Moshe that of course he would be upset that his beloved people, the Jewish people would be tortured and tormented even further. And that people would be beaten and hurt. It's like, what kind of plan is that? Like, well, that is the plan. That is the plan. So someone says like, you know what? I don't even wanna be part of that plan. It's like, well, that's what this world is all about. And in the next world, when we receive reward, what do we receive reward for? Our efforts. It's like, I didn't give up. I did not go to a place of yeush. I did not become, dis I didn't have despair. I actually love the Hebrew word yeush because it sounds like what it is. It sounds like the air being let out of your balloon or like yeush, you know, it's just like, whoosh, like I've, I, 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 I don't have it. I, I, I'm in a place of despair. So to keep trying, that's our goal. And we're learning that from Moshe this week. So that's the first lesson of life lessons from the book of Shemot. Now, on the other hand, and in complete contradiction and paradox, we have the obligation to have righteous indignation. We have the obligation that we see things that are not right. And it's because there is a problem of wrongdoing we are not supposed 
to be in a place of complacency and think, well, that's how things go. That's life, that's the world. We are not supposed to do that. So how do we know which thing we're supposed to do? So if it comes to a place of justice and righteousness, then we are supposed to act, again, to the best of our ability to take care of it. We are not supposed to accept it as like, well, that's the way the world is. So Moshe is our person, and perhaps he is chosen to be the leader of the Jewish people, not the least of which is because he acts when he sees injustice. And what does he do? Does In his early years, when he's still in the land of Egypt, that he steps out and he intervenes. So it's really beautiful. It's kind of like three examples in a row. It says on page 299, this is when he was growing up in the palace. It says verse 11 on page 299, chapter two, verse 11. It happened in those days that Moses grew up and went out to his brethren and observed their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brethren. He turned this way and that and saw that there was no man. So he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He killed him. It's like, you can kill somebody who was pursuing somebody else to kill them. That is totally legit. So he did that because he was outraged that somebody was attacking an innocent person. And so he stands up to that. That anger is the right kind of anger. And it's interesting, we always read this Parsha during the month of Tevet. Uh, I think we've spoken about before that Tevet is the month of anger. And it says, usually we are not looking to, um, we're not looking to be angry, but there is such a thing as righteous indignation. And righteous indignation is when we see something that is not the way it's supposed to be, and there's a lacking of justice, then we are supposed to intervene. And Moshe does that. He does that with the Jewish person. And then the next day, it's not, you could say, well, maybe he just hates Egyptians. So no, because the next day um, he goes out, verse 13, he went out the next day and behold, two Hebrew men were fighting with each other. And he said to the wicked one, why would you strike your fellow? And he replied, the other person replied, hold on one second, let me just admit, can't see, okay. And he said, who appointed you as a dignitary, a ruler and a judge over us? Do you propose to murder me as you murdered the Egyptian? Moses was frightened and he thought, indeed the matter is known. Pharaoh heard about this matter and sought to kill Moshe. So Moshe fled from before Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian and he sat by a well. So Moshe intervenes also, it's not just because it was Egyptian over a Jew, he intervenes also when he sees two Jews fighting. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you fighting? But then he has to flee when he realizes that he is, there's like a, there's a bounty on his head for having killed the Egyptian. And now he's gonna intervene again. Now he's in Midian. And it says, verse 16, the minister of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's sheep. The shepherds came and they were abusing the girls and they drove them away after they had already drawn the water. It says, Moshe got up and saved them and watered their sheep. So it says they, he got up, that word is understood to mean is that he was outraged. I got up, like that kind of got up, not like, oh, I was sitting by the well. So I got up and I watered this. Like, no, he got up and he saved them from the abuse of shepherds. And then he took the responsibility for watering their sheep. So we see that Moshe is a person with a keen eye toward wrongdoing and, a lot, and injustice. And this righteous indignation is what earns him the ability to be a leader of the Jewish people. So he has righteous indignation on one hand. And then on the other hand, he's supposed to be patient with the process with Pharaoh. That's a very hard balancing act. How do we know when to go ballistic? and when to keep our peace. And how do we know what we're supposed to do and where we're supposed to put our efforts and when we're supposed to say it's not happening yet and I just need to be patient. So there's this very fine balancing act where we have to figure out, and you can always ask somebody if you're having challenges knowing what to do, of where do we, where do we put our efforts, how do we evaluate them and how to navigate when our efforts are unsuccessful. That's the second lesson of the book of Shemot. 
is navigating the frustrations, but also being willing to have righteous indignation and to act, especially when there is a, an injustice. Um, questions or comments just on these first two that we are learning from Schmode. Andy, I can see you getting ready, but you're still on mute. Sorry. Um, when he saw the two Jews fighting and he asked why, then what happened with that situation? Did he go to Pharaoh or he sent them to Pharaoh? No, he was just trying to break up a fight um, between the two of them. He didn't do anything, especially when they said to him, oh, you're going to, are you going to intervene? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And that's when Moshe knew that even though he had kind of said that he had looked around to see if there was anybody around when he killed the Egyptian, he knew that the word had gotten out and that, that Pharaoh knew. And then he knew that he was in trouble for having killed the Egyptian. So the only thing that he did as far as to break up that fight was to be like the police officer who shows up at the scene and you know just by his presence. So they did stop fighting. They kind of ganged up on him, you know, which can also happen, which they say, you know, have to be very careful when you break up a fight that the people fighting don't turn on you, which mm -hmm. is basically what they did is they turned on motion. Um, so they didn't attack him, but they attacked him verbally and they made it clear to him that he was a wanted man and that he needed to get out of there. So he had his eyes open and it didn't matter to him where the injustice was coming from because some of us have selective sense of righteous indignation. Like it's, we're only upset if something happens to somebody who's like, in my family or my social group or my race or my whatever it might be, we're selective. Moshe, he was re ready to intervene when it was an Egyptian against a Jew. He was ready to intervene when it was two Jews and he was ready to intervene for th these people, these girls he'd never met in his life. So a perfect stranger. So to be a person who has the same level of righteous indignation, regardless of who the party is, that is um, that is really incredible. Let me just look at Renee's question. Uh, no, that's a very good question, Renee. Of of could he get away since he was royalty? Could he get away from um, killing somebody who was under him? Only if he could have had the person not been beating a Jew, since the Jews were the ones being tormented. The Pharaoh would have approved of an Egyptian beating a Jew. That was that would have been a good thing. So that that was not a problem. So, but what's interesting is that Moshe risks his royal status. So actually what you're pointing out is the other side, which is why is somebody in the royal family bothering himself with some poor Jew who's like from the other side of the tracks who's being attacked? Why does he just mind his own business? Because it's he's he's acting as if he has more of a connection with this poor Jewish person than he does with the Egyptian, when for all practical purposes, he is Egyptian. He's been raised in the palace. He is royalty. So that's even more incredible, is that you're stepping out of your social like caste system there to go defend a poor Jew against one of your fellow Egyptians. That's, that's actually more incredible that he is willing to do that. Okay. All right, so that is Moshe, is how of what we see in him and about him and what his own uh, learning process is. He needs to also, he also matures and develops as he uh, fulfills his role. One of the things that we understand about, that we've learned from our sages about Moshe is that he was born an angry person. It says that he kind of had, you know, some people are just kind of more feisty says that he was born like angry um, and that he had to actually work on himself to be patient um, and that that was a lifelong process of how he transformed himself. So the, the, it says like that there was like, I don't know, there was some study that you can tell by like the bumps in somebody's head, like what their features are, whatever that was. It says if somebody would have done that, they would have seen that he was born angry and that he um, had to work on that. So that you, working on that doesn't mean that you try not to ever be angry. It means that you're angry in the right time in the right way. And we know that as Moshe developed, you know, he becomes the big advocate for the Jewish people whenever they sin against God. He's the one who is praying on their behalf. 
save them, save me, you know, save all of us, forgive them. He becomes the advocate. So Moshe really transforms as a person throughout what we're going to see through the rest of the Torah. But starting from here, we kind of see him how he starts out. Andy. Was there a significance to Midian, why he chose to go to Midian? Oh, that's a really good question, Andy. I'm not sure. I think it was just that he was out getting out of Egypt um, and needed to be someplace else. Um, but I, I don't know. That's a really good question, which is kind of far away where they couldn't find him. So thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. There probably is something about it, but I haven't come across it myself. Okay. The next person we're going to learn from is from Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter, Batya, or Bisya. She's pronounced both ways. And that's going back to the beginning of Moshe's life, that we know that there was a decree of death against the baby Jewish boys and that they, um, Pharaoh tried to have the midwives kill the baby boys on the birth stool. That was his first strategy, um, just kind of like a covert thing, just like kill the babies when they're born. Um, the baby boys let, let the girls live and the midwives wouldn't do it. And uh, so he has to kind of up the ante and take another approach. So in chapter two, when Moshe is born, um, it says that this is chapter two, verse two, the woman conceived, meaning Yocheved, and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good and she hid him for three months. She could not hide him any longer. So she took for him a wicker basket and smeared it with clay and pitch. She placed the child into it and placed it among the reeds at the bank of the river. His sister stationed, meaning Miriam, stationed herself at a distance to know what would be done with him. So we're going to learn about from Miriam as well as Batia, Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe by the river and her maidens walked along the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and she sent her maid servant and she took it. She opened it and saw him, the child, and behold, a youth was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys, which she knew because he was circumcised. So it's like, ah, Jewish baby. Plus, why would a baby be in the Nile River? It's not exactly where you put someone. So what we want to talk about is this phrase here where it says that she, Pharaoh's daughter, saw the basket among the reeds and she sent her maidservant and she took it. So now we're going to go into the Hebrew because you learn something very, very different from the Hebrew than from the English. Because if I was going to ask you, Misty, if I was going to ask you, what was Batya doing? Who was she with and what happened? If you were making a play, what would you have happen? You have Pharaoh's daughter and what is she doing? So why don't you unmute him? Um, I would think that maybe Miriam was one of her servants. And oh, she, that's her, oh, that's and that she really would, and that she would have and she would have said to Miriam, "Go check that out." Ah, that's that's such a lovely interpretation. I I I think that's not it, but I love that interpretation that Miriam would have been one. That's beautiful. Um, one of the ways we know that she wasn't is for two reasons. One is that it says that Miriam was standing to see what was going to happen. That she was standing out of sight of of Pharaoh's daughter. And then she comes on the scene. But I really like what you said. That would be a great thing. Okay, let's think of another way if you're going to do this. It says that Pharaoh was with her, I mean, Pharaoh's daughter was with her maidens, right? So if you're making a play, you have Pharaoh's daughter and you have maybe like 10 little maidens accompanying her, like her, you know, ladies in waiting. She's royalty after all. So she would have her ladies in waiting. And then she's down at the river and she sees the basket. And it makes it sound so going off of what Misty said, that she says to one of them, right? Whoever it was, go and get that basket. That's what it sounds like, right? And you would have one of the maidens go in to get that. So let's see what the Hebrew says. So when it says and it describes who was there at the river, it says in verse five, and now we're going to go to the, the Hebrew, Batered Bat Paro that Bat Paro, Atia, the daughter of Pharaoh, went down, Lirchotz al Hayeors, to like wash at the river. And here's the word for maidens, Vena'a Roteha. 
Na'arotecha, a na'ar is a youth, masculine. A na'ara is youth, feminine. Na'arot is plural, feminine. Na'aroteha is plural, possessive, meaning her maidens. Okay, that's who she went down. You would expect then that when it says she saw the basket among the reeds and she sent her maidservant and she took it, you would expect the word for maidservant would be the singular version of one of those maidens because that's what you're picturing. She's down there with her maidens and she sends one of them in to get it. That is not the word that is used. So it's just fascinating what you learn from the Hebrew. So what it says instead though, is if you go right next to the letter Vav in the margin is where, the, where it starts. It says, Vatishlach et amata vatikacheha. She sent vatishlach, or she sent out, she sent out et amata. And the word is ama and not naara. And you might think, okay, what, what's, okay, big deal. Amata, so the word amata, the word is feminine possessive. And ama is a maidservant, and amata is her maidservant. Okay, amata means her maidservant. However, and we, we see this word in Hallel, we have a phrase that says, Ani Avdecha. Ben Amatecha, I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. Okay, so we use the word Ama does mean maidservant. However, it also means something else. How many of you ever heard or noticed that sometimes that uh, we use another word for measurement in Hebrew that's called an Ama? It's the exact same spelling, an Ama. It's like, what is an Ama or an Amot is plural Amot? It's, the zoom screen doesn't catch it all together. It's the measurement from the, the middle finger to the elbow. It's the forearm, it's called a cubit, okay? It's called a cubit, is an ama. So now let's read this a different way. Vatishlach amata. And she sent out her forearm, meaning not a person. She, the daughter of Pharaoh, sent out her own arm to take in Moshe. That's a totally different thing. This is why in many day schools, Sunday schools, one of the projects for the week, if they don't do the burning bush project with, you know, yellow, orange, and red tissue paper, or however they're going to do it, they do a please bring in a wrapping paper tube and they turn that into pharaoh's daughter's arm it says this was batya that she reached out and she extended her arm to bring in the basket to bring in the ark that was holding moshe and what's so amazing about that it's like okay so that's what you would do right if you're if you need to get something you need to reach your arm out to get it so what was amazing is that she wasn't really near the ark. It was kind of far out, but she stretched out her arm to make the effort, extended herself, and said, so God caused a miracle and allowed her arm to stretch farther than it really could reach so that she could reach the ark and bring it in. And this is a huge lesson for us as well of extending ourselves and putting in the extra effort and going beyond what we think are the natural limitations. This almost takes us back to Hanukkah. The oil's not gonna last for, except for one day. It's like, no, start and see how far you get. The, has, the um, Syrian Greeks are too strong of an army. There's no way we could do it. Start and see what you get. Start and see what you get. Extend yourself and God will help you and will lengthen your arm will extend your resources, your time, your money, your energy, your patience, your whatever it is you decide, we decide to extend ourselves in doing. So because of that, 
it was she was rewarded with the name she gave to Moshe being Moshe's name. It's like you extended yourself in that way. And that that's why the Torah gives the word. And that's why it uses that word. And it doesn't say that she sent a Na'ara. It doesn't say that she sent one of these maidens. It sent she, she sent her Amata, that she sent either, it's translated as maidservant, but she sent her arm out. So, you know, when kids make this thing with the, with the wrapping paper uh, deal um, with the tube, what, they, what do you think they usually do with this? Usually little kids, what do they usually do with this? They usually reach out and like bonk the other kids on the head with it, right? Because it's like, it's so fun to reach beyond our reach. It's so fun. There's something very, there's something very satisfying about that. So, so what is our real reach? Our real reach is not really limited by what we think it is. Like our reach is like, I can reach more people. Just think about what technology has done to allow us to reach more people. It's really unbelievable. Our words, our voice, printing things out, all of this is like, it's enabled us to have tremendous reach. What's more important though, is how much effort we put into the reaching. Of, they say, you know, reach for the stars and you may not get there, but you'll get to the moon that what we reach for really defines who we are. Like, what did you try to do? So this takes us all the way back to the beginning. What did you try to do? Not what you succeeded in doing, what did you try to do? And that's what we will be measured about. So having this inspiration from Batya, from Pharaoh's daughter, from having inspiration about reaching out and reaching beyond what we think we can do. It's just like, just start, just reach as far as you can go. Did you ever used to have one of those things? I don't know if not everybody's the same age, age and stage and nation here. But I remember when I was a kid, there was a little thing that was like, a, it was paper and it was rolled up like in a spiral thing. It was like coiled up and you would, you would like go like that with it. And if you did it right <clears throat> and didn't break it, it reached really far. And that was, that was our playground activity. I don't know, whatever, we were kind of boring, but we thought that was like the coolest thing ever. It's like, what am I reaching for? And to be like Batya, it's like, I can probably do more than I think I can. So reach for it. So reach for it, have the patience, don't give up. Be like Thomas Edison, all those other efforts, they're not failures. They're just steps along the way to finally getting it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So on one hand, we say, you know, we're results oriented and it's what we do, but we say that we are rewarded for our effort. We are rewarded for our effort. And the patience also at the same time to not become complacent, but to know how much effort to put into being like Moshe and having righteous indignation when there is an injustice against a person who we have an affinity for, or if we don't have an affinity for them, to be able to step up and to intervene. And finally, our person of Miriam. There's so much in here. Miriam as well. It says when it says here, and going back to what Misty said, it's like, where was Miriam in all this? So it says in verse four on page 297, his sister stationed herself at a distance to know what would be done with him. So that she was kind of, away. Unlike Yocheved, who did not stay on the scene to see what was going to happen. Miriam, this is probably one of the most profound sentences to me in the Torah, is verse four here, because the word is vatetatsav. Vatetatsav, from the word mitzav, means to station and to stand firmly planted. It's not that she just kind of like stood on the shore, that she planted herself stationed herself to see and watch redemption unfolding. So this is explored for those who have read my book about Miriam and Miriam's courtyard is a huge piece of this, is to know like what Moshe was told by God, this is going to be a process. Miriam knew intuitively. She is described as an intuitive prophetess from a young age six years old, eight years old. She knew that redemption was a process and that it was still unfolding 
even when things were looking terrible. And she had an 80, 83, 80, whatever, however, 86 year wait from the time of her birth until the redemption. That's a long time to hang in there. She does. And she's waiting for every little step to see how is this going to further redemption. And so she stays in a place of complete equanimity. She's not panic stricken. She's not making predictions. She's not shrying. All she wants to know is what's going to happen next and what's my next little step. And I love that her step to Pharaoh's daughter is simply, shall I go and summon for you a wet nurse from the Hebrew women who will nurse the boy for you? The fact that she does not panic over the fact that her baby brother, a Jewish, I clearly identified Jewish boy, is in the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. If it would have been me, I would have been like, I knew this was going to happen. It's terrible. Why did my mother put him in the river? This is horrible. What a disaster. I'm going to go yank him out of her arms and I'm going to go run away with him and go hide him someplace else. That would have been my response. Miriam was like, interesting. What does, what's the very next step that needs to happen? This baby needs food. Should I get a wet nurse for you to nurse the baby? And that's the step. And it is that step that sets the trajectory in the most unlikely thing. Who would ever believe that the path of redemption was going to involve the baby Jewish boy who was destined for death and drowning to be raised by Pharaoh's daughter in the palace. That's a little, I have to say, God has a good sense of humor. That's a little funny that that's how it's going to happen from within. It's like a coup from within. I wouldn't have seen that coming in a million years. But Miriam doesn't see the whole thing coming, but she sees the next step as tiny and as surprising as it is. I would love to have those eyes and those are really having the eyes of redemption of seeing like wow i didn't expect that and to see that things even while they are looking so challenging so bleak that at the same time redemption is unfolding we think it's going to be the bad time and then the good times like it's not how it works underneath the surface of the bad is like the good is being formed and it's taking shape. And it's a process. And underneath Pharaoh's initial no to the Jewish people and to Moshe and making things worse is the ultimate get out of Egypt, you're leaving, and, the, and an incredible redemption. To be able to hold these perspectives together is to face our own life's challenges from a much better place. It allows us to use the energy the intelligence, the insight, the resources, the wherewithal that we do have in a productive way, rather than being completely sidetracked, immobilized, deer in the headlights, frustrated, angry, despair, like it de that's completely energy depleting. So cultivating to someone say, oh, it's pie in the sky is like, you know what? Even if it is pie in the sky, it's your best shot. It is actually your best shot. So I hope that we will be all blessed, this Parsha of Shemot, to truly take to heart the lessons that we can learn from Moshe, from Miriam, from Batya, and be present to the process of the, all the ups and downs that are happening and to take it in our stride, not like, okay, I can deal with it, but say, no, this, the very up and down is what's going to make the ultimate um, the ultimate process happen. So I don't know when my um, handles are coming in. I don't know where I'm getting them from. Who knows? But um, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, Steve and I have been talking about our Aliyah process. And we decided that because people have shared so many frustrating experiences that they've had, really frustrating experiences, is to have the attitude that if it works smoothly, any, any one thing, if it works smoothly, we'll consider that just like a simcha. Like, wow, that was amazing. But not to have it as our expectation. Our expectation is that it's going to be a really stressful ungapachkid process that's going to make us want to scream. It's like, but if we know up front, it's like, 
don't worry about it. It'll all work out and it'll drive you crazy. But if you know that ahead of time, then that you can do that. We had, um, it's like, it's all a test. It's just all a test. I've shared this before. I shared this with Rabbi Lee Van recently is when I worked at Chandler's Shoes in the Old Cherry Creek Shopping Center, we had the company Edison Brothers Shoes would send in shoppers. These were people paid by Edison Brothers to come in and basically give the sales staff brief to see how we did, to see how we did. How do you handle an irate cost customer? How do you handle somebody who makes you bring 400 pairs of shoes in the days before DSW when you had to like have a salesperson actually go back and get the shoes for you? Like, how do you deal with all that? And so we had our, our store, we had a wonderful manager. We had, we had very high ratings from shoppers because basically we had as our attitude, anytime we had a challenging customer, we would just say shopper because it's like, it's just a test, don't worry. And when I had somebody throw a shoe at me because she didn't like the size, even though it fit her, um, you know, cause it was in a, I measured her foot and it was size whatever. Um, and I brought her a half size bigger because it was an Italian shoe. It has a shorter last, all these other things. And she put it on and it fit her. And she's like, great, I'll take it. And then she picked up the box and saw what size the shoe was. She goes, I don't wear that size. And she took, I don't want them. I said, I gave her my whole explanation. And she goes, I said, I don't want it. And she threw it at me and walked out. I'm like, okay, all right, there you go. I'm like shopper. So everyone around. So you have a different attitude when you know it's a test. So our life is sometimes shoppers, <laughs> like the people, the situations, it's just the test. It's just to see, it, not like in a way to play with us, but in a way to build us up. How are we doing in our approach to our challenges, our struggles, all the things that frustrate us, get in our way, how are we navigating that? So it's like a slalom racer, you know, it'd be so much easier just to ski straight down the slope. Why do you have to go around all these things? It's like that's where you get the good points. That's like the and people consider that like amazing. We're clapping for people who are navigating all that. So why don't we clap for ourselves when we do the same thing with the challenges that come up in our own lives? So we're expecting to go straight down the slope, but instead it's a slalom race. They just forgot to tell you. So now we know it's a slalom race. So don't be surprised. Be happy that the obstacles are actually there because it's there in those moments, the way we take those curves, that's actually where we see the quality of our ability to ski. And that's where we see our ability to live our lives. All right, any questions or comments or anything else at all? All right, thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next week. Have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank Enjoy. you, Ellen. And uh, be on the lookout for that next challenge that's coming your way. I can guarantee you it's gonna be there. But you're ready for it. All right, take care.